Hi everyone, my name is Janine and I'm going to be guiding you through the module on finding your story. One of the things that the iSwoop team talked about when we were planning this training was how we could give you a picture of what an iSwoop program looks like or what the process is that you go through in developing an iSwoop program and how that might be the same as or different from what the process that you go through when you're developing a more traditional uh, type of an interpretive program. One of the things that Martha suggested is that maybe I could share with you a little bit about my experience in putting together an iSwoop program that I presented at Acadia this past summer. And I love the program and I like the idea, but I was kind of struggling with how to do this in a way that didn't feel um, kind of totally awkward and inauthentic. And I finally settled on an interview format, which meant I needed to draft an interviewer. So this is Aiden, um, and he's going to take things from here. Uh, so what's the program that we are going to be talking about today? So the program is a pop-up program that I did in the Jordan Pond area of the park, which as you know is a really busy area in the park. Um, and the topic of the program was water quality research that's being conducted in, right there in Jordan Pond. And kind of the short version of the research is we've been doing um, water quality monitoring periodically in different um, ponds around Acadia since about 1981. But around 2013, there was a student who was looking at the, the, that data, and she realized that there had been a shift in the, in the clarity of the lake. So from the time they started monitoring them up until about 1996, each year the, the lakes were getting kind of increasingly clear. And then all of a sudden, in 1996, that clarity peaked, and it started going the opposite direction. So the question really is, um, why is that happening? What change that is causing the lakes to get, in a sense, murkier? And that's what the research is about. So how did you decide on that topic? Well, I had a couple of things in mind when I started on this program. First of all, I knew that I was going to um, be doing a pop-up program. Um, and that has certain considerations that go with it because, it because it's not advertised, it needed to happen in a really busy area of the park where visitors would find the program. Um, also, because I knew that I would be kind of um, interacting with visitors in the middle of doing something else. So in this case, they were taking a hike around the pond and they would be coming across me there along the trail and I'd be trying to s start a conversation with them. I knew that I needed to have uh, a really good hook that made them want to stop you know, the activity that they were doing and talk about it. Um, I also um, knew that because I was interrupting what they were already doing, I wasn't going to have a lot of time to talk to visitors. So I needed to have um, something that I could take all the way through to an interpretive opportunity in a short period of time. I figured I wouldn't have more than probably 10 or 15 minutes with most groups. Um, and I also knew that I wanted um, this to be an ISO program, which means it needed to be focused around a scientific research project. So this particular project ticked all the boxes. It's um, an interesting research project. It has a lot of um, kind of present day um, relevance, so it felt like it could be developed into an impactful program. Um, the data is collected using this huge water monitoring buoy that's floating out there in the lake. Visitors can see it as they drive down into the Jordan Pond area. They can see it as they're walking around the lake. So it makes a great um, kind of tangible hook to capture their uh, attention. Um, and it's pretty easy to explain. The complexity is there if someone wanted to have a longer conversation about it. But the basic premise of the, of the research is pretty simple. The lake isn't as clear as it used to be, and we want to know why. So how did you go about developing the program? Well, I think I started developing it pretty much the same way that I would develop any um, interpretive program. I started with kind of just a background um, research, and I and I the first place I went looking for information was in Irma, which is the online portal where they have um, information about research that's happening in national parks. Um, and, and you never know what you're going to get when you go in the Irma portal. Sometimes there's lots of information, sometimes there's only a little bit of information, but it's always a good place to start. Um, and it gave me kind of um, the clues that I could follow to get other information. So once I knew who the researchers were that were involved, I could look at what kinds of other research they were doing. Um, you know, once I um, knew kind of what the main things they were looking for, I could kind of research topics like dissolved organic compounds and uh, the causes of changes in water clarity, things like that. Um, I also kind of found out that um, this project, when it came together, was um, had a lot, a lot of players involved in it. There was, you know, the scientists from outside the park, there were researchers from within the park, um, but it also, the buoy was quite expensive. It took outside funding, and that funding was provided by Canon USA and by the Friends of Acadia. So right from the start, there was an outreach piece that went with it. The buoy, basically, it has its own website. 
So, um, you know, kind of led me to that website and there was a lot of information on there, a lot of images on there. So that was kind of all background information that I did to get started. And that's not really any different than what I do for any type of program. Um, but then the next step is what kind of sets the ice with heart, and that is that I made an appointment and went and talked with one of the researchers that was involved in the project. Um, and that's something that's kind of um, unique to iSwoop, and it's, I think, what kind of gives iSwoop its heart. With all of that research, um, did you really even need to have an interview, or was that just uh, courtesy? Uh, no, I definitely still needed to do the interview. I think that one of the things that makes iSwoop sci style science communication different from the way that we've typically communicated about science in the parks is the focus on not just what the study was and what we learned from it, but on who is doing the research and what motivates them to do the research and what kind of effort goes into uncovering that information. You know, We want to find all the little stories along the way, the frustrations, the breakthroughs, the bloopers that went, you know, things that went wrong while they were doing it. And, and those details are the things that bring the science to life. Um, it's often pretty easy to find information about what's being studied and how and what the, res what's the research is discovering, but it's really hard to get that back backstory unless you're talking with somebody who's really directly involved in the research. What kind of backstory were you looking for? Well, it can be a lot of different things. I mean, sometimes it's as simple as the science itself, and sometimes that piece is compelling enough to engage an audience and create a story arc. Um, but it could also be the adventures that the scientists had as they were conducting the story. Did they have a setback or um, you know, something funny that happened to them in the, in the field or a eureka moment or whatever? You know, when I asked the scientist that was involved in this case, his, his our air and water quality specialist, his name's Bill Gawley, um, when I asked him about the challenges that he'd had, he told me a story about going out to the lake one morning to um, get the data off of the computer and realizing that there was nothing there. And, uh, and then kind of figuring out that what had happened is that the lake had been struck by lightning. And he talked about, you know, the, the buoys out there in the lake. So it's like an iceberg. There's a little bit of it that's on the surface of the lake, but most of it's hidden under the water. So he couldn't look from shore and know what had happened to that buoy. He had to go get a boat. And he talked about going and getting that boat and going out there onto the lake and just not knowing what he was going to find. You know, he could have pulled that buoy up and found a big blob of melted plastic. And if he had, that would have been the end of the project because there was no funding to replace the buoy. So I can certainly um, empathize with that, what that must have felt like to put so much um, kind of effort into a project and then know that something as kind of random as a lightning strike could destroy everything. Um, but in this particular instance, that didn't feel like it was quite compelling enough to drive a program. Um, another angle is to try and find something that just humanizes the scientist, um, gives that researcher a little bit more dimension. I think one of the barriers to getting um, the public to um, think about science is that they have this kind of stereotypical image of a scientist and they're this crazy smart, really remote person working alone in a lab in a lab coat. Um, and that kind of stereotypical science t scientist isn't a very relatable person. Um, but the reality is that scientists are people just like you or I. Um, and being a scientist is only one part of who they are. They're also parents and friends and teachers and athletes and artists. Um, and they have all different ethnicities and belief systems and lifestyles. Um, so being a scientist isn't your identity. It's just a part of who you are. And talking about that can help to put a face on the science. So one of the things that I learned about Bill is that he actually composes folk music and performs it and has produced some recordings of his music. And he told me that his music and his air and water quality research don't very often cross-pollinate, but occasionally they do. So for example, he once wrote a song called Don't Merc Me, and it was all about mercury pollution um, in the park. And I can dem imagine developing an evening program um, that started with that piece of music and maybe playing that piece of music and talking about the local composer and what inspired him to write this piece and why it was so important to him and then all of a sudden arriving at the science and I think that could be a really great way to get people hooked into thinking about it. Um, because I was doing a pop-up in this case that was kind of too long of a process to use in that context of a program um, but and definitely something that if I were doing a longer program would be something that I would consider um, as a way to to get into the program. So what did you end up with? Well, I ended up going pretty directly into the science, starting with what interested the visitors the most, which is what was this great big thing in the middle of the lake? You know, a lot of visitors would comment on that buoy right away and want to know what it was. Um, and the ones that didn't oftentimes would co comment on the lake and how clear it was. So that was just a, a great way to kind of 
um, start the conversation. So you ended up not needing the information from the interviews then? Oh, not so. You know, one of the things that I asked Bill about was the science itself. You know, what inspired the project, um, how they got it going, what were they trying to figure out, what were their predictions, those kinds of things. And I think the thing that made me realize that I could go straight into the science with this particular program was that they have two competing hypotheses about why the pond is changing. And one is that climate change um, is changing rainfall patterns and causing more dissolved organic compounds to be washed into the lake and that's what's causing the lake to lose its clarity um, and that of course would be a bad thing uh, but the other hypothesis is that we're actually seeing the lake recovering as a result of the clean air act reducing the acidity of rainwater um, and that would be a good thing um, so that kind of contrast really intrigued me i i thought you know when we, anytime we tell visitors that something is changing, especially if we tell them something like this is getting less clear, um, and then we ask them why they think that is, they immediately think we're going to like step onto a soapbox and tell them what they've done wrong and what they need to change and how humans have screwed the system up. Um, but if you can ask that question and throw out that, yes, maybe this could be a human-caused impact, but it also might be a human success story, then suddenly that, that surprises them. And they let down their defenses and they're just curious about what the alternative is. Um, and so it was just a great way to start a conversation. And it's something that I would never have known about unless I had done that interview with Bill because the results of this study aren't in yet. It's not been published anywhere, so I wouldn't even have known what their hypotheses were. And how did the visitors respond? Well, this was just a regular program. It wasn't one of the iSwoop um, study programs, so there aren't actually um, post-program interviews with visitors asking them what they thought of the program. But my sense was that they responded to it really well. Um, it was pretty easy to get the conversation started. The majority of the visitors spent at least a few minutes talking about the research that was being done in the lake. I'd say probably three quarters of them stopped and had a conversation with me about it. So it felt really successful in terms of engaging um, the visitors. And it also felt like it led to a substantive, rel relevant conversation. You know, obviously climate change is a really big, important issue right now. Um, and the future of regulations protecting the environment are also a current issue. So hopefully this gave visitors something to think about. And when they are listening to the news and they hear someone talking about climate change or about the Clean Air Act, um, they'll remember this conversation and they'll think a little bit more critically about what our responsibility is in making decisions about those issues. So what do you see as the biggest benefit of this type of program? Well, for me personally, I think one of the biggest benefits was that it made for a very natural conversation. I'm really comfortable um, with formal programming where you prepare things and um, the audience comes knowing what to expect and you have a conversation. And I'm pretty comfortable in a visitor center setting where visitors are coming to you with their questions. But I've always had kind of a hard time with informal um, interactions in the field. Um, some people do it very well, but I'm naturally an introvert, and it feels very intrusive to me. It's hard for me to get that conversation started, and since I don't know what direction it's going to go, I um, mean, I have a hard time taking it all the way through to a strong interpretive opportunity. Um, and this felt like it, the, it allowed the conversation to start very naturally, and because that scientific research project gave the, the interaction a focus, it also made it a lot easier for me to take that interaction through to some kind of um, a meaningful interpretive opportunity, whether that was helping visitors understand something about how the lake was changing, or something about how scientific knowledge is constructed, or just making them aware that there's science happening kind of all around them. Um, but I also think it's really important that we talk um, about how science happens because we all have to make decisions in our, in our lives that we can't make well unless we're scientifically literate. And some people get comfortable with science very early on um, and can make those decisions, but for those who don't, there really aren't a lot of non-threatening opportunities to get comfortable with science um, later in life. And I think that talking about science the way that ISWOOP talks about science um, is, is very accessible. It lets people see that this is not some hocus-pocus process and it's not something that's so difficult that they'll never be able to understand it. Um, it just allows them to kind of have a conversation and creates an opportunity for people who maybe don't think very much about science to hopefully have a really positive experience thinking about scientific research and take a step towards being scientifically literate. So it's good stuff. So I just want to thank Aiden for helping out with the interviewing today. Thanks, Aiden. Um, and I want to invite all of you to check out the Module 2 thread on the Common Learning Portal, see what your homework assignment is before the live session, and I will see you all there.